Hello and welcome to the Movie Therapy Channel. We are Jim and Sam, and this is the show where we like to give you our rating first, and then we like to talk about the things that we did and did not like about the movie we just watched. This week's movie is Glass. So Sam, you ready to give a rating for Glass? Yeah. Okay, so our rating for Glass. Three, two, one. Wait, Wait for, for it. it. Which is too bad, because 95% of this movie, I was completely enthralled, and then the last 5%, yeah, you were not very happy about it. Why? Ah, <laughs> <sighs> let's talk about it. Glass is the third film in M Night Shyamalan's comic book inspired trilogy. I assume this is going to be the last one. Everyone assumes this is going to be the last one. So, uh, if you haven't seen the other two films, uh, they're pretty fantastic. I like both of them. I uh, watched Split earlier this week. Second time I saw it. Seen Unbreakable a couple of times. So, with Glass, I want to break Glass down into the three acts. And the final act, we're going to get into spoilers towards the end of it. So, okay. we're going to talk about uh, the twist, the couple of twists that happen at the end. But I just want to start off with, like, the movie opens up. We're reintroduced to David Dunn, Bruce Willis' character. And Philadelphia has dubbed him the Overseer. Philadelphia doesn't know that he himself is the Overseer. They just know that the guy in the cloak with uh, the rain jacket... They call him the Overseer. He kind of protects the city from uh, criminals or idiots. The movie opens up with like these kids making YouTube videos. And Bruce Willis finds them and hunts them down and then teaches them a lesson, essentially. Yeah. He himself is like a vigilante justice yeah. person. And I was actually completely enthralled with the whole opening. I thought the opening was somewhat, was pretty electric. And then... I don't really remember um, Unbreakable, but... I was very, I, I've seen them all and I know I've seen them all. So like there were bits and pieces that were coming back to me, especially when they were doing throwbacks to mm. like little clips of the throwbacks of each movie. But I thought the beginning was so intense, I, like edge of the seat intense. The entire movie up until the end was like just kind of that intense that you really want to know. And I wasn't really looking forward to this film and I was very tired. I didn't really want to go see it. So I was like, oh, I hope it's good so I don't fall asleep. Yeah. And I did not fall asleep because it like the beginning was like so intense. Yeah. The beginning is very electric. Uh, I mean, that's what I would consider it. Mm -hmm. It pretty much hits the ground running. Yeah. Uh, David Dunn is after the Horde, which is what they have now deemed James McAvoy's character. I mean, they, they waste no time in the beginning. It's just right in it, and it's super intense, and it's just ready to go. And so Bruce Willis and his son, they run their security firm, and Bruce Willis' son helps him hunt these people down. And Bruce Willis' son thinks he's, like, triangulated uh, the horde's position, like, where he might be holding these uh, girls. Because mm -hmm. since Split, uh, the horde has been kidnapping girls and sacrificing them to the beast. Yeah. And then Bruce Willis is trying to find him and stop him from continuing to do this. And I was actually surprised how early into the film they had their first confrontation. Because it's really about like 15 minutes into the movie where they actually meet for the first time and have their first uh, throwdown. Which I thought was uh, really cool. Bruce Willis goes for what he calls walks. And that's when he goes for walking in crowds of people looking for bad people. The beginning was the best. He's like, Dad, I don't think you should go for a walk today. Let the man go for a walk. <laughs> yeah, and my Shyamalan plays the character. That was the director. Yeah, was it? Yeah, that's the right director. And then Bruce Willis goes for the walk. He finds uh, the horde. He walks into him, uh, accidentally bumps into him on the street. And then he follows him to his lair. And that's when they had like, their first throwdown. And I was actually uh, quite surprised. I thought it was pretty cool, their first fight. And then it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> And then their confrontation ends with the police sort of stopping them. Uh, they have like weapons to subdue uh, both of them. And then we cut to their inside of the uh, mental institution right. or wherever they take them. And this is when, uh, from what I've read, a lot of people or at least other critics or whatnot, said like the film slows down and gets kind of like meandering. I actually found the hospital sequence or whatever this mental institution is, not that it was exciting, but it was engaging. Yeah, I didn't have any issue I with that. I didn't find any of it boring at all. I think I liked it a lot because of Mr. Glass really shines through in this time where he's starting to mastermind this whole ending and how they're going to escape and you're just kind of you're really involved in the situation that they're trying to go through but then um 
I, I didn't think it was boring or like slow or anything at this point, but be- I think maybe because the beginning was so intense that it goes from like, normally it's the other way around. Normally like it's a slower film in the beginning and then it gets intense. So I think the fact that they had it intense in the beginning, I can see where critics are kind of saying stuff like that, but I didn't think it was, I like that because that's where you really got to know the characters and mm-hmm. especially if you're someone who's not necessarily know the characters or you follow these movie pieces so i think it really was able to remind me who all three of these characters were yeah and i think they do a good job of making it so you don't need to see the other films to see this Mm -hmm. one uh it does heighten the experience if you have seen the other ones but everything's recapped you see like flashbacks of the previous films yeah they do a good job of catching you up and getting you in the know of what's going on so when they're in the hospital, the whole idea that the mental institution is that this person who's played by Sarah Paulson, I can't remember the character's name. She's trying to convince or whatever. She's trying to convince them that they don't have superpowers, that they're not special individuals and that they have delusions. Mm-hmm. And she has these seminars with them to explain away these sort of like these delusions that they have is because they've had damage to their frontal lobes of their brains that make them delusional. Right. Uh, all, I, I liked all that stuff because she actually gets into their heads. It's kind of like uh, psych warfare kind of in the well, mental institution. She almost got me convinced. I mean, there was a point where I was like, oh, maybe they are just like, maybe this entire thing and the big oh, the big ending is going to be that they don't actually have these superpowers. Yeah, that could have been the twist. I mean, that could have been I a thought. possibility. Yeah, that's what I kind of thought. I mean, so she convinced them. She convinced me. I'm sure she convinced other people. But so I thought... That was kind of where the direction of the movie was going to go. And then the ending of the movie was going to be them stuck in this hospital for a long amount of time and just kind of go from there. Yeah. Now, the thing that makes the film, or at least the middle part of the film, as I felt entertaining as it was, is that James McAvoy is so good as the Horde. And in the first, or at least in Split, the second film, we only see like five or six of the personalities. In this one, we see far more. Yeah. He goes through. There's he like goes a, through a ton. He's, he's got like a Southern cowboy in him. He's got like a, a film professor, specifically of Japanese films from the 50s and 60s that you see. Uh, there's a couple of other ones. Those were the standouts to me. But there's a couple of other ones that uh, pop up. And they pop up. And they pop up because the doctor has this strobe light thing that when a dangerous personality comes out and tries to escape the room, the strobes start flashing and it makes them switch to a nonviolent personality. I mean, if, the, yeah, and so I'm wondering if even those personalities came to light only because of those strobes. Like, those were totally new and random and they just kind of came to light. Maybe they were something that he never actually had gone through until he went into the hospital. No, he had them. There's 23 oh. personalities inside of them. There's still a yeah, bunch but we haven't you seen. Said, oh. So anyway, he's there in the the hospital. My only real issue with the second act is that I thought, and I don't know if it's even an issue, is that the movie's called Glass, and Samuel L. Jackson's character Elijah, who is Mr. Glass, doesn't really he doesn't have his first speaking lines until like halfway through the film, which I thought was kind of odd. Well, Usually, he a was film supposed like, to be sedated. Uh, he was f- faking though. Right, but, the, the but whole, he was still supposed to be sedated. Yeah, but the whole idea, like when you have a movie that's named after a character, usually you would open the film with that character and that character would be the driving force of your plot. And I get what M. Night's doing. He's doing like a deconstruction of the superhero genre. So he's playing against conventions. So the convention would be Glass would open the film. He would then be the driving force of the plot. M. Night kind of flips that on his head, does not introduce Glass. We actually don't even see him probably until 20 minutes into the movie. And he probably doesn't start talking until 45 minutes to an hour into the movie. I don't know. I thought that was fine. I didn't it bother bo- me. It bothered me a little bit. I'm sure it did. <laughs> so I just felt it was a little perplexing, but I get what M. Night was doing. Uh, I wasn't 100% on board with that aspect of it. It was like mm-hmm. a little confusing for me when it was like, I was like, when are we finally going to actually see this character start talking and doing stuff? I uh, think the it purpose eventually... of it was that the entire time he was doing something, it was just silently. I think that was the purpose. Yeah. And then once once he actually starts getting out and starts orchestrating stuff, mm-hmm. uh, the film starts to pick up some steam, plans start getting enacted. Uh, and then that's that's pretty much the middle part of the film. That's the second act. It's those guys in the 
hospital. Bruce Willis's son uh, plays a part with trying to convince the doctor that Bruce Willis isn't crazy. Anya Taylor-Joy, who plays Casey, I believe her name was, from the Split film. The only thing that I thought was weird is that she has like some form of like affection for Kevin Wendell Crumb, who is the Horde. I mean, I don't think that an affection is was really the problem with it. So it, it was just a little weird because uh, you'd figure that she would want to see him put down in some way, shape, or form. No, because she was the only person that was able to see that this was like... She was able to understand him in a way that nobody else did because of her own past. So I thought that it was... Yeah, and that's weird. I understood why... Uh, I, I didn't think it was weird at all. I think it was understandable because she was... It's not that he, she was even infatuated. It's that she f- fell for him as a friend. Like, she was able to get Kevin out because she had that conversation with him in Split. And she was able to see that you kind of had to manipulate the other characters to set herself free. Like, that was the whole purpose of Split was that someone was able to understand and work with him like no one else ever could. So I didn't see that as an issue at all. It's like the Horde and uh, Casey had sort of like a Hulk and Betty Ross sort of vibe to it, where Betty in the comic books and in the movie, she would be able to calm the Hulk down from being the Hulk and turn him back into Bruce Banner. And Mm. Casey was sort of like that. She would go, go up to the Horde and then she would calm him. And then she would bring out Kevin Wendell Crumb, who's essentially Kevin Wendell Crumb is to the Horde as Bruce Banner is to the Hulk. Right. And that was like sort of Casey's. And I feel like that was her point of that character to have that kind of relationship with the, with them. And I, to your point, I think like she identified a little bit with them because she could bring out his good side. But I, mean, I think, I that's think a, it, the affection area was kind of a little hazy, but it didn't. I understood that she was there specifically to bring Kevin out, and that was she was the only person that was able to do that because she understood him in a way nobody else could. And I feel like that was M. Knight sort of doing his reflection on like the Hulk and Betty Ross mm-hmm. from the comic books, because a lot of this is deconstructing comic books. There's a lot of comic book talk. Right. There's a lot of thing like in this issue of this comic book, the hero and villain did this and this. Now, are these based on real comic books? I know. So I feel like the the Casey and the Horde relationship is very much kind of like that. Just instead of like the Hulk being sort of a, a misguided good guy, the Horde is essentially a bad guy. Yeah. Now, once we get into the third act, which for me, this is my only real issue with the third act. And this is where we're going to start talking about spoilers. Now, the big twist that... Seems to have a lot of people divided. Is that the Doctor character in this film is actually there's a part of a secret society <coughs> that actually finds these superhumans and tries to convince them that they're not actually super. And the impression I got says she's given three days to convince them that they're not actually super. Mm-hmm. And if she can conv- can convince them to stop using their powers in three days, that they're not actually real. Right. That they'll let them go back into society and they'll be good. But if after three days they don't... Uh, or not successful, they like kill them off. If they don't comply with the conditioning, then they'll put them down. Essentially is what happens. And that's kind of what happens at the end. Is that David Dunn and the Beast, their fight kind of comes to a stalemate. The Beast then tries to go run to the tower to do enact Mr. Glass's plan. And then that's when Casey comes up to the Beast and like convinces Kevin to come back out. And then when she convinces him to come, out, come back out, the Beast goes away. Kevin Wendell Crumb turns into a human. He gets shot by a sniper. And then we see like a close-up of like this clover on a guy's wrist. Have mm. no idea what that clover was because there's no hints to it at all. It's very random and out of left field. And then you see David Dunn in the grass because he was uh, thrown into a water tank. So he's like weakened because of the water. And then some SWAT guy comes up to him and sticks his head into a puddle and drowns him. But before he drowns him, the doctor comes up, touches him and shows him like what's like what's going on, what's really going on. And that's when he has the vision that this is actually like a secret society that's trying to convince them that they're not real. And then after he has his vision, that's when they actually finally kill him. There's only one thing they could have done with this movie that really could have bothered me, and they 
did it, and that was killing David Dunn. Mm -hmm. Like, the last thing I wanted to see in this film was David Dunn die. And not only did he die, it's just the way that they killed him really rubbed me the wrong way. I did not like that. I feel like if you're going to kill David Dunn, for me to feel more satisfied with it, I would have preferred had he died defeating or at least fighting back the beast. Maybe like after their confrontation, he's so badly hurt that he can't recover and he passes away that way. And then the SWAT team comes in and finishes the beast or the mm -hmm. horde, whatever you want to call them. I just thought the end was kind of unimpressive. Like I didn't really think that all of this lead up just for them to have like a argument outside and then them to get taken down by like a SWAT team kind of people. I just thought that wasn't very impressive. Kind of like what you said, it was disappointing in a way. And I thought that it could have been, I was waiting for another anti or another hero like character to come out from the SWAT team side and like the bad guy side who's trying to convince them that they're all heroes and then them take it down and then have like some kind of weird battle that way or interesting battle that way. Mm -hmm. I just, like you said, if the fact that, you know, David or, um, yeah, David, Bruce Willis's character dies in a puddle from like a SWAT team drowning him. Like I get that it was because he doesn't, you know, he's afraid of water and that was his biggest fear, but like, I don't know. It's just weird in a puddle. Yeah. That some guy who has no abilities is able to do that. It just didn't really feel like a successful ending. I didn't mind that they all died, but like you said, the way that they died, I actually was thinking that maybe what was going to happen was that they were going to have this like hero-like character that was going to come out and fight them and defeat them, but it wasn't like that at all. Yeah, that you make... What you say makes sense, and I actually would have played into the themes of deconstructing the comic book genre because that essentially I mean, that's kind of what superman is in the dark knight returns comic books where he works for the government and his whole job is to keep other sort of other supers in check yeah. if not just make them just not exist yeah so i like i think if these supers was on like they had one like tucked in their back pocket that was going to come out at this time it would have made it more understanding that if if David's character had act, had died in a pool uh, or in a puddle of water, it would have come from someone who with who has similar strength abilities as David. Unlike just, I just don't think some regular Joe should have been able to take all those down, all of them down. Yeah, actually, now that you're saying this out loud, I actually think it would have been cool if one of the nurses in the facility, one of the male or any nurse really. It could be a nurse. It could be a female nurse. Yeah, there weren't any female nurses, though. That's why I'm just saying, like, one of the male nurses. But there weren't the only... Oh, I guess there wasn't, now that I think about it. The only girl or in even, that facility was the doctor. Even the psychiatrist. Like, the woman who played the psychiatrist trying to convince them, even if she had, like, hero-like abilities or was a super or whatever they called them. Yeah, maybe, like, the down, reveal, like maybe, cool. maybe, like, the reveal, like, maybe, like, the beast is trying to kill her and then it's revealed that she herself actually has superpowers. Right, like, I think that would have been cool. And I, I don't know if that would have gone through the lines of, like, you know, you would have seen it coming kind of thing. I wonder if people would have thought about it like that. But I, I just think that them being taken down by a SWAT team like group was kind of left me feeling, unimpressive it just left me feeling hollow because one of the things i like yeah. about david dunn is that david dunn to me is kind of like he's the old man sort of version of like a peter parker where peter parker is an ordinary person yeah. with extraordinary abilities yeah who's just a photographer in his real life david dunn is just a regular person with extraordinary abilities who's a security consultant in his regular life right so i teams up with his son yeah, and I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of people that probably resonate and identify with David Dunn and doing what they did to him. A lot of people were pissed. It was just I think upsetting. I don't mind that he died. I mind how he died. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So past that twist, I actually didn't mind the secret society twist. That doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother me either. I just think that I think what it sounds like you are saying is that the biggest issue was that the way that they were taken down at the end was just kind of like, okay. And then um, the fact that it wasn't, it was just un unimpressive. It wasn't, it left you feeling like, okay, whatever. Like you didn't really feel for the character. You weren't really happy. Like when they died, you were like, that's it. Like it wasn't like I felt for the characters who died, except for the fact that I was annoyed by the way that they died. Yeah, and then the there's another twist after the twist. So that I didn't mind. No, that I like. And the movie's called great. Mr. Glass, and the very 
the final twist of this film is that Mr. Glass's whole purpose ever since Unbreakable, his whole thing is that he's wanted to prove to the world that superhumans exist. Yeah. And that comic books are actually based on super, on real life experiences that people have had right. with these supers. And that there's a basis for also like fantasy is based on things that have actually really happened. Yeah. So Mr. Glass's whole thing in this film is that the final twist is that he wants to prove the existence of supers and this whole final confrontation, everything at the end was all part of his master plan. Mm -hmm. And what we find out is that it was his intentions from the beginning for them to all die in that front yard. Yeah. And use all the security cameras and everything that they had set up to monitor them to reveal to the world that these people are actually real. And right. so what he does is that he compiles, he had like some sort of like program that recorded all the security footage. And then uploads it to like a back system. Yeah. And then it gets uploaded to the internet through uh, David Dunn's son, Anya Taylor Joy's Casey, and then Mr. Glass's mom. They yeah. all like find this footage. It gets sent to them, and then they upload it to the internet to prove the existence of these superhumans. Yeah. And then, in essence, sort of defeating the secret society, like their whole purpose to sort of keep these people under wraps. Yeah. So the end does play into the themes of the Mr. Glass character and what he wanted to accomplish, and he does accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. And that I, I, I did like that about the ending. The ending, the the fact that the double ending was great. The second ending, where well, the final ending where everyone got to see what had happened was nice. It yeah, was like, when it okay. goes like they upload it to the internet, it goes viral, and then you have the three characters that are left from the the three supers. Yeah. So like the son, the victim, the mom. Right. So they're left and they're watching everyone. They're watching this video go viral and they're seeing everyone react to it. And then all of a sudden they're like in a public place and then there's a TV in the corner of this area that they're at. And it's like a news broadcast and all of a sudden the news starts playing the video that was uploaded of the supers. Right. Of the three of them. And so there is sort of a bitter sweetness to the ending that even though David Dunn went out the way that he did, but he went out with people knowing Sort of who he was, his heroics. Yeah. He is somewhat kind of honored within that video mm -hmm. that they put out. Yeah. Now, uh, with all that said, I mean, that's essentially my feelings on all the story beats of the film. What was, did you have a favorite scene in the film? Uh, yeah, I did actually. I think one of my favorite scenes was when um, James McAvoy's character was in his room and the kept flashing and you would see all of his different characters and there were new characters that we saw or personalities not really characters but new personalities that came to light mm -hmm. where she's talking to him and then she starts to feel for some of the character and she's scared of some of the characters i thought that was really cool yeah. what was your favorite what was your favorite su super out of the three of them well, who's James your favorite boy yeah just, he's such a good actor he's he i mean yeah no kidding just the way he can go from one character to the next one right after the other. Who is your favorite personality? I like the kid. Yeah, like Hedwig is... Boy. Hedwig's fun. Hedwig's great. I did like the cameo from the Japanese professor. The yeah. Japanese film professor was great. What's the cameo of that one for? Nothing. He was just the Jap he was just a film professor. He's like, I'm a professor of film, mainly Japanese films from the 1950s and 60s. Oh, I thought he was like somebody. I think Split is my favorite out of the three of them. He's the most interesting, I think, and the way that James McAvoy can, you know, in, you know, he can portray all of those different characters was quite impressive. And I think that's what I liked Split so much. Yeah. Like the movie Split and then seeing him in this, I thought I thought him and David were the two main characters, Kevin and David versus Glass, even though like you said it was about Glass. Yeah. But I think it was about Glass just because of his mastermind idea at the end. I don't think he was meant to be one of the main characters, or at least that's what it appeared. Favorite scene would have to be the the beginning when David Dunn goes looking for the horde, and then he actually finds him. That whole sequence from when he leaves the thing, it was it was uh, both.
funny. You're introduced to the characters that had their first fight. I just was really, 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 really enthralled with that second half of the act one. I thought yeah. it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I, I kind of liked seeing how David figured out who everybody was because I didn't know how he was able to track people. So it was cool seeing that. All right. That's it for me. That's it for me. All right. Uh, that's it for our discussion of Glass. Uh, did you see it this weekend? If you did, what did you think of it? Uh, where would you rate it in the three films? I think I might put the, the might, might be number three. I think it might go in order. I think it might be Unbreakable is my favorite with Split being second with this being third. I don't remember Unbreakable well enough to put it in an order right now. That's it for us. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you like this video, like and subscribe because we got more coming. And as always, we will see you next time, guys.